It takes a special breed to be a truck driving man and a steady hand to pull that load behind. Okay, since this thing decided to crawl over here on the table by itself, <laughs> I guess we got to do something with it. And it's kind of interesting between number three and four, we got a lot of black, a lot of discoloration on the spacer plate. Spacer plate on a 343 has six polar holes on it because it's doweled. Doesn't come off as easy as a 3406 with the little teeny dowels. Because this is a man's motor here. This is back when this is back when Caterpillar built stuff stout. So let's see what it takes to break loose. So my plan is, is to uh, get this thing tore down and uh, start putting her back together. We'll start out with uh, the machine work that's got to be done, finish tearing it down, show you everything, timing gears, all that stuff in the back. And uh, I will have to take the spacer plate to somebody and get it. Um, well, that is stuck. I'll have to get it glass beaded and cleaned up good. Or maybe I'll just take a scotch Bright pad to it. But it's still got the machine marks in it. This was a brand new spacer plate when I put it on. She's a popping and a cracking. Boy, it is really stuck right there. I ain't never, I ain't never seen one stuck like that, man. Hmm, she don't want to come. So we'll just give it the old mallet a little bit here. There we go. Popping up now. Still pretty stiff. She's really stuck in there. A lot of carbon and stuff in that between these two holes, so. Something was going on there. Too much horsepower is what was going on. So when Bruce Mallinson was here from Pittsburgh Power, he was looking at it. We were talking about, you know, turning it into a DI and all the complicated things that come along with that. Uh, I think I'm just going to leave it original, go back the way it was, platter banger, because when you... I've been told by Brian Blocks, the one that originally told me, he's got a master's in engineering. He told me that DI engines have bigger crank bearings. When they went to the B models and the DIs, the crankshaft size and the rods, rods and mains increased size dramatically and width. And uh, I'm assuming the reason that a DI motor has to have a bigger, wider journal is the fact that with a DI engine, I think a 3406B, don't quote me, but it's in the, what is it, 25, 26 degrees of timing, initial timing. Uh, whereas this old girl, so the early ones had, the static timing was eight degrees before top dead center the later models, once they got into the later 70s and the pollution requirements, they went to 11 degrees before top dead center. And then your variable timing advance would uh, crank the timing up, I think, 8 degrees. And uh, your 3406s also have a timing advance on the front of them. Now your computerized ones, it's all on the computer because it's all electronic. There we go, there we go. Okay, we're gonna take this off. Let's have a look here at number between three and four on this side. And you can see, I don't know, you probably can't see that. So, right in here, you can see the discoloration. A lot of black right there. So, 
I never did I never did finish my story about Bruce Mallinson. So Bruce was here and we were talking about DI. And he asked me how much boost I was making with this. And it would bury the boost gauge at 30 PSI. So he got out his calculator phone and ran a little what if. Turned it around, put it in my face, and he said that's how much power you were making. And it said 583 on it. And I believe it. Uh, C15 didn't have anything on this old girl. Anyway, that turbo that was on it, that old Garrett T18, uh, was not supplying enough air. And uh, I'm sure that was part of its problem. Not enough air to burn the fuel. So, how about if I put twin switch blades on it? That ought to make the boys over at Cat Engine Masters happy with Gleet. No, probably not. I probably get crap for taking an old single and turning it into a twin. <laughs> what do you bet? I don't know. So I sold the after cooler to a gentleman in Tennessee that had a, a model, or no, he had a Peterbilt with a 1693. And it was a three and a quarter, and he overhauled it, and he wanted to bump it up to four and a quarter. So I sold that to him because I didn't. I plan on going with an air to air on this one, and that means I got to build some kind of groovy intake setup. Now I do have the plenum over there for a loader setup, which is just a plate and a hole going into it. I could use that, or try to do something different, interesting, cool. Okay, so there's the blackness, and she's black over here. See now the deck. You know I don't I don't know if this was it when I put it together if it got machined. I don't see a lot of machine marks on it, and that could be our problem. Maybe we're gonna have to take it and get her cut. Yeah, there's some. Yeah, it got machined. I don't know. There's something wrong here. Definitely a liner's dropped or something. So anyway, we'll go through this and build it from the ground up, show you, talk to you about liner protrusion, show you how to measure all that, and uh, how you seal up one of these old girls. It'll be fun, they said. It'll be exciting, they said. Won't it? Exciting and fun. Look at that. That's heat cracking. And those are pretty bad. And that's from overfueling. Now, this baby had a T1810 Garrett on it. And the exhaust housing was a 1.0. <laughs> so I imagine the drive pressure was horrendous. So... We're going to put a switchblade on this thing and a way bigger housing and I bet that drive pressure will drop dramatically. Now, am I going to poke that much fuel to it again? I don't know. I have to, you know, I really wish I had a drive pressure gauge on it before it went down, but didn't think of that kind of stuff. Need to do it on one of the scrapers uh, before I switch it over to switchblades, see what the drive pressure really is. So number six is the one that dropped the valve, uh, shoved the valves up inside. It didn't ruin the head. This is a broken off piece of valve stem. So this is the bolt that holds the heat plug in. This is what's left of the plug that was on top. Anyway, that goes through the bottom of the piston and uh, holds that heat plug in. And this is the heat plug because the pre-cup, uh, the combustion takes place inside the pre-cup and then it blows that charge down against here and out onto the piston. Without this heat plug, it would blow a hole right through that aluminum right into the crankcase. Okay, this right here is the pre-cup on a 1693. This is the nut that retains the nozzle. This is the nozzle holder, and this right here is the throwaway nozzle. These are pretty cheap. 
Uh, they're probably 50 bucks a piece now. I don't know. It used to be like 25, 30. So it's only got one hole in it. And when they're brand new, they'll probably pop a little over 700, maybe 750. Uh, they're good clear down to 640. If they're still popping at 640, you're okay. When these go bad and they just squirt, you know, pee a stream in there, your engine will knock and you'll think you got a, a rod gone, uh, but it's just one of these that's gone bad. Uh, I've never had one go completely bad, but I've had them knock when it was idling real bad for a minute and you'd wind it up and it'd go away. So this goes inside the pre-cup here and inside of here, this is your pre-combustion chamber. Right here where this is, this is where your glow plug goes. You heat the glow plug, it turns cherry red. You start cranking it, that fuel sprays into there and helps it get going. But this chamber in here is what gives Caterpillar pre-cuppers that unique rattle because of that uncontrolled detonation going on in there. Now, when that explodes inside there, it comes blowing out this hole with cutting torch effect and it blows down against that heat plug right there because they sit right over top of that heat plug. So without that heat plug in there, it would literally blow a hole through that piston. So also too, this is surrounded by antifreeze and then this groove here is for the O-ring that keeps it going up inside the head. So a PC motor has what they call high heat rejection uh, the heat inside here is transferred to the cooling system. Therefore, a PC motor needs a bigger radiator, uh, bigger than a DI motor. Okay, I want to show you a, a cutaway of the 1693 piston. Here's your heat plug. Uh, look at how thick that is. There's uh, like an inch and a half, inch and three quarter of aluminum in there. And this is your DI piston. This one right here happens to be a 3408 piston. And uh, you can see where the fuel hits it in here. Doesn't burn it. That's your fuel bowl. Um, not near as thick around that one side right there, is it? But then it probably doesn't have to be. So part of the problem with converting one of these to DI and using 3406 pistons is where they put the piston pin. And you'll notice the distance from here to the top is considerably less than this one. So if a guy was going to convert this over to DI and use 3406 pistons, you have to have custom billet rods made i priced them there was a guy said he'd make them for me uh, uh for six thousand dollars so about a thousand bucks a rod uh the rod you would need would have to be uh 0.625 tall longer than the standard 1693 rod to make that work they both use the same size piston pin but because the deck height on this 1693 is so much taller than a 3406, you can't make it work. Plus, your 343 rods are the full width all the way up, whereas your 3408, 3406 uh, get skinny at the top uh, to go inside that skinny little hole. Not exactly sure why they did that, but this one is has got a huge area in there. There's the nut and the washer that holds that on. Um, anyway, the 3408, 3406, 1693 are both 5.4 uh, bore engines, 6.5 inches of stroke. If a guy had the money, wanted to spend the money, I'm sure you could figure out how to change one over. Uh, Brian told me the, that the bearings wouldn't last as long, but it would be interesting to see how long they did go. 
Uh, see how long it lasted.